Now let's see how what we learned from Bell's experiment can be put to practical use for cryptography. And this is um, the basis of the so-called EPR protocol. EPR stands for Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen. Um, they published a very famous early paper on quantum theory in which they proposed precisely the kind of experiment that I showed you on the previous page with entangled particles. And um, so for this reason, the, the Bell pairs or the Bell states are sometimes also called EPR pairs or EPR states. And the protocol is called the EPR protocol. The basic setup is as follows. We have the two legitimate communication partners, Alice and Bob, and they share in advance now not one, not just one bell pair, but many, many, many bell pairs in the same bell state that we saw on the previous slide, this bell state beta 1 1. And once again, they perform measurements on their member of the pair of a pair. And these include the same measurements that we saw in the context of Bell's experiment. So on Alice's side, these observables Q and R, and on Bob's side, the observables S and T. So they are the same observables that we saw on the previous slide. However, there's now there's, there's a modification. In addition to these two observables on each side, Alice and Bob are, are allowed to measure a third observable. Alice is allowed to measure also S, which is the same S that Bob measures. And Bob is also allowed to measure Q, which is the same observable that Alice measures. So what happens? Alice and Bob perform on their members of these many bell pairs. One of the three measurements that they are allowed to make randomly and without uh, sharing beforehand sort of the order or which measurements they want to perform, but independently and randomly they measure, they perform one of the three measurements on each member of the bell pair. And then, yeah, for different members of different bell pairs, they perform different measurements in a completely random fashion. Now, it may happen that for, for one bell pair, Alice and Bob measure the same observable. So it could happen that by accident, they both measure Q or they both measure S. These are the two possibilities. So for some bell pairs, Alice and Bob will have measured the same observables. And for others, they will have measured different observables. If they measure, when they measure the same observables, then their outcomes are guaranteed to be opposites of each other. Because this Bell state beta 1 1, this is the Bell state with perfect anti-correlation. And remember that's the Bell state 0, 1, minus 1, 0. So if in the standard basis, that's obvious, if um, the measurement outcome on one qubit is zero, then the measurement outcome on the other qubit is guaranteed to be one and vice versa. 
This battle state beta 1 1 however has the additional property that this perfect anti-correlation also holds for arbitrary measurements not just in the standard basis so in an arbitrary basis so it doesn't matter whether Alice and Bob both measure Q uh, which would be Pauli Z that's that happens to be the standard basis then it's perfectly anti-correlated but also when they both measure S then it's also perfectly anti-correlated So what is clear is that um, if we if we just look at cases where Alice and Bob performed the same measurement, then their results will be perfectly anti-correlated. Now, um, after they have performed all the measurements, Alice and Bob talk on the phone or over some other communication channel and they share with each other which measurements they performed. Yeah, so Alice tells Bob, okay, I first I measured Q, then I measured R, then I measured S, then I measured S again, then Q, then R, and so on. And, um, and likewise Bob. And then they group the bell pairs in two groups. In one group, they have all the bell pairs on which they performed identical measurements. And in the other group, they have all the bell pairs on which they performed different measurements. Looking at the bell pairs where they performed identical measurements, the same measurements, since they know that their results must be perfectly anti-correlated, one of the two parties, either Alice or Bob, can simply apply an inversion, can invert all the measurement results. And then Alice and Bob will have the same, the same catalog of results. So the same bit string. Uh, each measurement outcome is plus or minus one, or you can transform it into zero and one. And um, so Alice and Bob have, for these measurements, they have the same bit string, the same list of results. This is what at the end will become the shared key. The other bell pairs where they perform different measurements, they will be used to ensure that nobody eavesdropped on this sharing process. The other bell pairs where the measurements were different are used to calculate the expectation value of the observable A that we saw when we discussed Bell's inequality, this particular observable A. Yeah, so there's, as long as you have a sufficiently high number of Bell pairs, and then you have all possible combinations of observables that Alice measured and Bob measured, you have sufficiently many bell pairs for each combination that with the desired accuracy you can determine the expectation value of that observable A that we saw on the previous slide. And so Alice and Bob can check whether the expectation value of A that they determine in this way is actually equal to the Thirlson bound, is equal to 2 times square root of 2. If it is, then Alice and Bob can be sure that the qubits that they, on which they performed the measurements were actually in the Bell state beta 1 1. Yeah, that's confirmation that they were actually in the necessary Bell state. If they have this confirmation, then they know there was no third party, no eavesdropper, who tampered with the bell states. Now an eavesdropper, in order to extract any information 
about the communication between Alice and Bob would have to establish some correlation with the qubits that are shared between Alice and Bob. And we, we discussed in one of the previous lectures, we discussed, discussed the monogamy of entanglement. We discuss, discussed the fact that if you have two systems that are in an entangled state, they cannot be correlated in any way with a third system. So here the conclusion is if Alice and Bob have confirmed by measuring the expectation value of A and finding that it's its value is sufficiently close to the Cyrilson bound. Alice and Bob have confirmed that the qubits pairs were actually in the belt state beta 1 1. With this confirmation, they know their qubits were in an entangled state and therefore they cannot have been entangled with a third party. And therefore a third party cannot have extracted any information. And that already proves the security of the EPR protocol. So it uses two very fundamental results here. It, it uses Bell's inequality or the violation of Bell's inequality and the result about the Tsurlson bound that we saw previously. And it also uses the monogamy of entanglement. And in combination, this guarantees the security of this protocol.